Welcome to calculus. We call this chapter zero because it's things that you should already know from previous math classes. In this section, we're going to define and develop the concept of a function, which is the basic mathematical object that scientists and mathematicians use to describe relationships between variable quantities. Functions play a central role in calculus and its application. So start off with a couple of definitions of function and variable. Read over those, make sure you understand them. It's all review material. We've got an example of a table that describes a function. A function takes any input and maps it directly to an output. Every input can only have one output. And we've got some notation here too, like that f of zero equals three. That means when x equals zero, y equals three. F of 1 equals 4 means when x equals 1, y equals 4. This is notation you should be totally familiar with. y equals 3x squared minus 4x plus 2. We could rewrite that in function notation by just changing the y to an f of x. Because x is the only variable, we can say this is a function of x. Vertical line test also should be familiar to you. Got a little diagram on the left. Anytime you can draw a vertical line through a graph and hit two or more points, that means the whole graph is not a function. So what's really going on there is you have an input that has two outputs. And that breaks the rule of a function. X squared plus Y squared equals 25. You might remember from geometry that that's a circle with radius five. Clearly, this does not pass the vertical line test, so this is not a function. We could restrict the domain to make this a function. We'll talk more about something like that later. For instance, we could just look at the top half of the circle, which is a function. Some absolute value rules and the graph of y equals absolute value of x. Familiarize yourselves with those. Make sure you agree with them. Part D might look a little new. Piecewise functions. This is something we did in honors pre-cal. We're going to review it here. We're graphing three pieces together. They might connect, they might not. And each piece is restricted on the domain. So we're going to put a graph in and see what this looks like. From x equals negative 1, to the left, we want zero. So I'm going to go to x equals negative one, put a solid dot at zero, and just shade to the left forever. Square root of one minus x squared, that one might be a little trickier. I'll come back to that last. The last piece says graph the line y equals x, starting at x equals one, and then getting bigger. So I'll plug in one first and I get 1. And it's a closed dot because it's greater than or equal to. Then it says, we just go on forever. So I'll plug in a couple more points to get my line. Plug in 2. It's really just a line with slope 1. It goes on forever. That middle piece might be a little scarier for you. Let's look at what that's really saying. It's saying y equals square root of 1 minus x squared. If you can look at that and already say, oh, that's clearly the top half of a circle, then good for you. If you can't, let's look at why this is the top half of a circle. I square both sides. I add x squared to both sides. That looks like the equation of a circle with radius 1. But because I only want positive y values, it's really only the top half of the circle with radius 1. Looks something like the open circle at the end. We're going to see stuff like what I just circled a lot. If you can get it into your mind that that's really just a circle, you're going to go places. Next example, maybe pause the video for a second, read over what it says. 
So what we've got here essentially is a piecewise function that tells you exactly how much the wind shield factor is going to be based on your based on the wind speed. For slow wind speeds, 0 to 3, there is no wind shield factor. It's just 32. It doesn't change between 0 and 3. But the harder the wind blows, the lower your wind shield factor goes. You're getting colder and colder. And we can see that in this graph. It's a piecewise function. It's got the open dot to match up with the less than symbol. It's got closed dots to match up with the less than or equal symbols. Now we're going to talk about domain and range. Domain is all of the input values, or x values, of your function. Range is all the y values, or the output values. Again, this should be familiar material. Natural domain is something that we're not going to talk about a whole lot. It just means all of the places where you can plug things in. We normally just say domain. We don't say natural domain. So for instance, if I were to write y equals 1 over x, you'd know I wasn't going to have you plug in 0. You'd say the domain was all real numbers except 0. And that's really what the natural domain is. So this example says find the natural domain of various functions. That means just what's everything we can plug in. Part A is friendly. There's nothing that causes a problem. So we say domain is all real numbers. Part B looks like we can't divide by a couple things. So we might say domain is all real numbers except 1 and 3. So the mathematically correct way to write that would be domain is negative infinity to 1, union 1 to 3, union 3 to infinity. I'd also accept it if you just wrote out in, as a sentence, domain is all real numbers except 1 and 3. I'd also accept it if you just said x does not equal 1, x does not equal 3. As long as you make it clear to me what's either in the domain or what's not in the domain, we're good. If you don't remember what your tangent graph looks like, go back and study your pre-cal notes. You'll notice that every asymptote comes at a starts at pi over 2. So looking at a graph here, there's an asymptote at pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 also goes backwards, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2. Other than those asymptotes, we say all real numbers. So the best way to say that would be domain is all real numbers except pi over 2 times some n. We can't have multiples of pi over 2 in our domain. There's a lot of ways you could say that, but as long as you get across the idea that you can't have those multiples of pi over 2, I'm happy. Part D, I think, is the trickiest. x squared minus 5x plus 6, we could plug any number into that. But because of that square root, we need that whole thing to be positive. x squared minus 5x plus 6. We need that whole thing to be positive or equal to 0. So we're going to factor that. x minus 3, x minus 2. Looks like we have a couple of numbers that are worthy of investigating, 3 and 2. Those are actually called critical numbers. We're going to learn a lot about critical numbers as we go on. What we really need to do is ask ourselves, OK, if 2 and 3 are the places where we actually get 0, between negative infinity to 2 is either going to be positive or negative that whole time. I'll choose a number like x equals 0 and plug that into my factored form. I get negative times a negative is a positive. So our function is positive on that whole interval. 2 to 3, I could plug in 2.5. going to give me a negative times a positive. 
So we're going to get square root of a negative number. Can't do that. And lastly, we plug in a big number, like, between 3 and infinity. I'll choose, like, 4. It gives me a positive times a positive, which is a positive. We're allowed to take square roots of positives, so that first interval works. Negative infinity to 2. And 3 to infinity works. This idea of finding places where a function equals 0 and then doing something with it is going to be a huge part of what we do in calculus. Next, we're finding the natural domain of a function. Notice x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 looks like it has no problem anywhere except where the bottom equals 0. So x cannot equal 2. You can see that in the graph down here, we've got the open circle. Notice that this looks almost exactly like the graph of y equals x plus 2. You might remember from pre-calculus when we simplified something like this function. Back to the top. And in pre-calculus, we said, oh, there's going to be a hole at x equals 2 because of the canceling out. That also causes a domain problem. It's all review from pre-calculus. giving you some pictures to go with these problems. It's asking us for the domain of a square root function in part A. The only thing that should red flag you on this problem is we need the square root to be bigger than or equal to 0. So x has to be bigger than or equal to 1. That's our domain. You can see that in the picture. All the x values are bigger than or equal to 1. Part B. We don't have to graph the whole thing to figure out the domain. We just know we can't divide by 0. So we know x minus 1 cannot equal 0. That's our domain. And again, we can see that in the graph provided. We've got an asymptote at x equals 1. We're going to go back and talk about the range of both of these. One way you can get range is by looking at the picture. That's the easiest way. But you can also get it by looking at the actual problem. 2 plus something. And that something is going to be 0 or bigger. So that means 2 plus 0 or something bigger is always going to be bigger than or equal to 2. And we can see that in the picture. Similarly, we can figure out the range on part B either by looking at the graph, which is the easiest, or we can do some more pre-calculus. We know that we're going to have an, a horizontal asymptote wherever the limit as x approaches infinity of our function is. And that's, in this case, at 1. If you don't remember how to find those horizontal asymptotes, come see me. But again, the easiest way is to look at the picture, which also has the horizontal asymptote. And our range is all real numbers except one. So take a look at this problem for a minute and then we'll talk about what's going on. I recommend you pause the video while you read over. Part A is telling us that V is the volume of the box and it wants us to come up with a formula. Volume of a box is length times width times height. We can see in this picture that the length is 16 minus those 2x's. So that would be 16 minus 2x. The width would be that 30 inches minus the 2x's. And the height is x. We could clean that up to distribute that through, get a nice clean function that says v of x equals something. Part B says find the domain of V. Well, domain means all of the inputs that we're allowed to put in. Noticing, looking at the X. X can't be bigger than a certain number. Looking at the width and the height, it looks like we're width and the length. We're limited by the length, 16 inches. We can't cut out corners of the box bigger than 8 inches. Otherwise, that wouldn't physically work. We also have to cut something off, so our lowest value is 0. 
So we can go anywhere from zero to eight inches. We can't actually cut off the full eight inches because then we'd be cutting the box in half. We can't cut off exactly zero because then we wouldn't be able to fold anything up. So we've got to be somewhere between zero and eight for our domain. You could also write that other ways. You could say domain is zero to eight using, looks like infinity, using interval notation. Part C says use the graph of V to estimate the range. Fortunately, they were kind enough to give us the graph. So we just have to look at that graph and say it looks like our smallest possible volume would be zero. And our biggest possible volume would be somewhere a little bit bigger than 725, or a little bigger than 700, maybe 725. We could also write that a different way also. We could say could be exactly zero to 725 at the most. Part D says, describe in words what the graph tells you about the volume. And tells you a lot of things. As you get closer and closer to cutting out zero or eight inches, our volume looks like it's getting down low. That's called a minimum. The closer we get to, hard to tell just by looking, but maybe right about three or so, somewhere between three and four, is going to give us our maximum volume which is probably what we're going to be looking for in a real life situation. If you're making a box out of a piece of cardboard, you're going to want to make that box as big as possible, most likely. I recommend you pause the video, read over this problem, and then we will talk about it. Hopefully you looked at this and thought of the equation distance equals rate times time. We're given the rate. We're going 100 feet per second. So all we need is time, and we can find out distance traveled. This whole thing happens over a one-minute period, except we're not talking about minutes. We're talking about seconds. So our t is in seconds. Since we're only looking at that one-minute period, we start at zero seconds. That's right at 8.05 when he starts clocking us. And then one minute later would be 60 seconds. And we can see that in the graph. This is kind of hard to read. I think that the, they're easier to read on some of the later ones that I made. You can also find this on page 11 in your book. This is the quick check exercises that you should either tr start trying now, or if you feel super confident, you can wait till class to work on them. But these will be what you're expected to know how to do.